Isn't it ironic that sometimes we try to discipline out of our children what we planted so deeply? Ooh, hey. That could go on a Barnwood sign, actually, Jamie. There you go. You're, you're part of this crew now. Yeah. That was good, Jamie. <laughs> like that was, that was deep. That's awesome. Welcome back to another <laughs> episode of the Entrepreneurial Family Man Podcast. I am Chris Niemeyer. Here with my good friends, Michael McGreevy, Christopher McCluskey, and Jamie Slingerland. We are four guys crazy about our wives. We love our kids and we want to kill it in business. This podcast is about those important domains of our lives, where they intersect, how there can be tension, realizing that we want to be authentic and transparent here. It's okay that there's that tension. This is a safe place to talk about that. Today, we want to tackle head on this idea that kids are always learning from you. What are they learning is the key. And let's be honest, guys. I mean, the, as dads, as guys in the house, sometimes maybe our frustration level might be a little, a little higher than normal on occasions, or we've picked up things from our past and our childhood that we've brought into how we're parenting. Let's talk about this today in terms of how do we approach parenting and what our kids are learning from us before we even teach them. You know, this first point I want to talk about is they don't care what you share unless it's clear that you care. Is that like a John Maxwell quote that you kind of <laughs> Niemeyerize? <laughs> McGreevy wrote this one. I've got to throw it back to him. What did you really mean by that, McGreevy? <laughs> they don't care what you share unless it is clear that you care. People Listen. don't care how much you know. Oh, yeah. They don't, they don't Jamie, care what you know you unless they editing. know that you care. People don't That's it. care what you know unless they know that you care. That's what I was getting at. And I tried to change the language so I could get it on another Barnwood sign. <laughs> wow. Boy, there's a quote in the Bible that says, there's nothing new under the sun, right? That's true. true. All just adaptations of truth. Yeah. And so I borrowed it again. But okay, the main point being, of course, that let, let's say you listen to something on the topic of taking care of your kids and raising them up in the way that they should go and you're ready to teach and you're ready to impart all your wisdom upon your kids and then you so you decide you're going to start teaching them what we're getting at here is if you haven't built that equity with them if you don't have a strong connection if they aren't absolutely sure that you love them and care about them and enjoy being with them you love them like crazy they are not going to really be interested in what you have to say it's so true that our kids pick up so much of not just even what we say or maybe the the philosophy behind what we're saying, but the ways that we say it, like the little nuances of things. They'll 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 language things or they'll show a particular facial expression or a or a body posturing as they deliver the thing because they're just little they've got those mirroring neurons going on in their brains. They're mimicking what they're seeing. And a lot of it happens unconsciously. But every single one of us as men now, as adults, we will find ourselves saying things and then all of a sudden you go, Oh my goodness, I sound just like my dad. Or, whoa, that sounded like my mother. I know where that came. Well, yeah, we're doing the same thing. It's human nature. We mirror a lot of things, oftentimes very unconsciously. And I think uh, we want to be more conscious of the messages we're trying to send to our kids because they're going to pick them up, whether they're good or not so great or even flat out bad. It's a challenge though, right? So we all, we all want to teach them, instruct them in certain ways. How do we love them first practically before we sit them down and have a stern conversation about what we want to teach them. That usually doesn't work very well. So how do we approach loving them first? How do they, how do you identify as a father, how they receive love and how they give love? Well, I think there's such an opportunity that we have as EFM guys, the way we are designing our life. And we've talked on other episodes about dating our children and spending quality time with them. There's got to be a lot more to the relationship than just hard talks about deep things. There's got to be sharing with them, bedtime, and it comes out of a relationship. I know if my kids aren't comfortable coming to me and just being with me during a regular time when there's not something bad, how comfortable they're going to be when we have to talk about something difficult. 
So it goes back to McGreevy's awesome quote. I struggle with that, to be honest. Sometimes I feel there's like this heaviness when something happens and we're playing defense as a dad where we got to get in there and um, maybe we get in the way of ourselves. Like that happens with me. We are a big part of the problem that we're not being loving and caring for our children. And if, if we can't come in with a deep level of empathy and compassion, then the wall's going to go up for them, right? Because we can't even manage ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this isn't all that easy, right, Jamie? I mean, we, you'd think that by the third kid, I'd have it figured out, my system of loving them. But it, it turns out every single one of them is completely different. So what makes my oldest feel loved is completely different than what my daughter Skylar feels loved by as well as my youngest son and so there's no manual here Um, I found that I have to dive in and go deep with each individual kid in a completely different way and that's not easy my oldest son not super physically affectionate once in a while I'll get a hug out of him but most of the time he's prying my hands off of him when I try to (laughs) hug him he wants me to be with him and do something with him that's how he feels loved um, my youngest man, we can stay in an embrace for 20 straight minutes and we'd both be, have big grins on our face and, and that would be enough for us. We have to figure out how our kids feel loved. And we've talked about the love languages here before within the context of our marriage relationships, our kids have love languages too. And gosh, we got to figure them out if we're going to learn how to love them. Right. Yeah, I like those examples, Michael. I'm, I'm thinking through my own kids, our, our four. But you, what you did is you actually took the time to observe and reflect with each one of them how they receive love, how they give love back to you. And then now you're more aware of how to give the love. And then in those situations, that's where, not that the guard is down, but they're more receptive to hearing some of the teaching that you might want to do, Right. I'm thinking of my kids, like Jesse, he, uh, you know, he, he loves time together and, and being together, reading a book together, laying down on the couch, talking like that's just, he loves that. He digs it. Right. And that's the entree into talking about maybe a book he's reading and then pivot into the topic at hand or, or a deeper issue. You know, Noah, he's Mr. Athlete. If I can get him out playing and running around, there are moments then when I can, I can slide in some different analogies or metaphors uh, that really help, helps open up his mind. Uh, and, you know, the two girls, just like you were saying with Asher, I mean, I can just love on them and hug them and cuddle them. And we're just talking, you know, pillow talk kind of stuff with daddy kind of. And, and it's, that's just the beauty of being able to pause and really reflect on each child and their ability to receive love and to receive the teaching that you want. Chris, it, it gives me the, the reminder, too, to share. You had a beautiful moment with your two daughters, two adult daughters recently. And just share about the context of that. Sure, yeah. I had an email exchange with Grace, who's 23, and Sarah, who's 18. All of our kids have some real degree of musical interest and artistic abilities and all. So those two, Grace and Sarah, are particularly artistic. And they are our quietest children. Uh, you oftentimes have to make a point of getting them to put words to whatever it is that they're thinking and feeling. But if you tune into the artistic expressions, they're actually, you'll hear what they're thinking and feeling through their music or through their drawings, their art, and their their various uh, creative writing and all. In fact, I'll just read the, the brief email I sent to them. Remember, these are now what people, most people would consider kind of adult children, 23 and 18. I sent them this little note. Hey, you two. Uh, I am reading a philosophy book called Stillness is the Key, and I just came across this quote that made me think of you, and here's the quote. We want to learn to see the world like an artist. While other people are oblivious to what surrounds them, the artist really sees. Their mind, fully engaged, notices the way a bird flies or the way a stranger holds their fork. Or a mother looks at her child. They have no thoughts of the morrow. All they are thinking about is how to capture and communicate this experience. An artist is present. 
and from this stillness comes brilliance. So I didn't have any agenda there. I wasn't looking to necessarily engage a big discussion. I was looking to just love them, to send them a message of love. I get you. I hear you. I, I love who you are. And this kind of speaks a little bit about what I hear in both of you. Both of them responded really strongly in the affirmative. They just both said, oh, my goodness, yes, that is so much how I find I can't imagine not noticing those things. And yet, if I try to raise them to people, sometimes they look at me like, um, okay, yeah, it's, they, I feel a little weird or, um, or, or like maybe it's just dismissed, like, okay, yeah, whatever, um, that other people don't get it. So both of them received from me, call it a, 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 an email hug or something. They got a strong measure of affirmation and love from dad about who they are through a very simple intentional act, just, just communicating, I, I get you, I hear you, and I really like these qualities about you. I love that example. I mean, first of all, Chris, I resonate with what your daughters are saying because I'm a lot like them. I notice these quirky little details and want to point them out. But what's really cool is that you gave them a place to communicate their hearts, who they are openly. And not only was there space to do that, but it was affirmed and it was encouraged by you. My gosh, what a connection that you're building with them to give them that space. Even though you might not be wired like that at all, you gave them that opportunity and you built like a very strong bridge with them. And that didn't, that probably didn't take you a super long time, right? You just recognize it, something that reminded you of them. And you're like, oh yeah, I'll send this out real quick. And wow, what a difference you made in their lives. And I love that example. And it brings us to our next point, which is the, probably the most effective way that our kids learn. And that's by what they observe. And that's both yikes and good right because they pick up the good and bad of what we're living out oh, i'm taking a deep breath because i just had this happen the, the other day we we're joking about it in the beginning of the show today but when i get mad or when i correct my kids i yell out hey what, what are you doing and i didn't notice i did that until i heard my own kids yell out when they don't like something hey i <laughs> Give me that back. Or when they're talking to their sisters or they're playing, they pick up the bad and the good of everything that you do. But it was encouraging too, because there was another, there's another thing that I observed too, is as my kids pray, they all bury their heads in their hands and close their eyes super tight. Like they're, they're almost living out the book of lamentations or something. They get all <laughs> intense and into the prayers into the they tap into their spiritual side and they really dig in and it's almost like they're trying to connect with God on a deep level and I think they've observed that in me and so it's it's cool to see the good things but man it is humbling to see the things that you don't like them live out like you said earlier Nehemiah we are teaching our kids even if we are not teaching them I love this I resonate I don't scream hey at them but <laughs> I've realized even on an emotional plane that there's two primary emotions that I feel happy and then angry. There's just been a level of growth for me to not get in the way of myself when I had these conversations with my children. So just the way that I communicate with them, I posted in the chat here a little bit ago, the struggle is real. We are the problem oftentimes for me just to go to one of my children softly and to say something in a way that is palatable for them. Instead of me to be like, what were you thinking? And get all angry and let them feel what I'm sensing. And then they move away for them just to draw them in and talk softly and be like, I need to tell you about something. I know that's what I learned in the classroom as a teacher. As soon as you yell, you connect them with the fight, freeze, or what is it, McCluskey? Flop and flap. <laughs> <laughs> fight, flight, freeze, or appease. But hey. <laughs> just handling it differently in what you said, McGreevy, right? Instead of saying, hey. Just change the narrative so that the, our kids see that we have a growth mindset and that we are handling things differently. And then we can really meet them halfway there if we get out of our own ways. Angry and happy, there's more of a range of emotions than those two. <laughs> That's good. You know what I, I get in response now? Hay is for horses. Nice. <laughs> Every time I yes. yell out hay, because guess what? 
when they say hay, I say hay is for horses. So they're <laughs> picking up everything. They're like sponges. It's like, my goodness, I got to watch what I say. That's so cool. I was thinking about Rachel raising our kids and our oldest, Alyssa, used to play all the time with this little Fisher Price people dollhouse that she had. And we had bought her lots of add-on pieces to it and and the grandparents and other little friends that could come over and play at the house. So she would spend hours making up stories. And Rachel was listening to her story one day and, and just, you know, Alyssa wasn't aware that she was being overheard. She was probably four or so. And she had the little baby in there throwing a tantrum, going, wah, wah, that's mine, you know, and the other one. And, and she had the mommy come in and say, are you feeling frustrated? And he went, yes, they took my toy. Well, what do you need to say to them? And then she had the mommy turn to the other one. How do you think that made them feel? Like she was playing out with her little dolls exactly what Rachel did with the kids when they would have emotional outbursts, you know, just feeling angry. Then she would help them process it to put different words to what they were angry about and help the other person yeah. understand how that hurt their feelings at all. Kids pick this stuff up and how cool that they do. I hope we're listening, Michael, like you, you are where you're recognizing, oh, I know where they got that from. Hmm. <laughs> Is that the message I want them to be getting? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well done, Rachel. I'm furiously taking notes after that example. <laughs> yeah. Are you Thank frustrated? You, Rachel. My new question. Yeah. Well, it's, it's good that we brought these examples up there, right? Even just of there's emotional, there's physical, there's the spiritual that they're sponges for. They're picking up. You know, I'm, I'm thinking as you were sharing that story of the toddler, Chris, my, my parents tell the story when I was about four years old, I had a grandfather that lived near us and I just adored him. I mean, he was just like, he was my granddad and he was a retired sailor in the Navy, um, had an accident. So he walked with a big cane and a little limp going on there, shoe size or shoe that was a lot bigger than the other. But I just adored him. At one point he made me a little four-year-old version of his cane, exact little like replica oh, wow. of his cane and had the same little sailor hat that he used to always wear. And so I had learned, and this is, you know, my parents telling me later, I had learned to walk like him too, because here I am in this little sailor's hat with this little cane and I was fine, but I would walk with a little limp behind grandpa. And I just take that visual to say there's power in all that we do, our, our words, our emotions, our physically what we're doing. They are watching at such a young age. Mm. And Jamie, you brought it up. And so let's just get to it, right? Like real life situations, sometimes good, sometimes bad are what they're learning from. And sometimes they're the best opportunities to teach, whether that's a situation that we did or the, that the kids did, that's a great opportunity to reflect some of these values that we want to instill in them. So who wants to go first in sharing maybe a bad, maybe a good opportunity where, where real life happened in your home everybody's touching their nose <laughs> <laughs> okay i guess i lost that one <laughs> i didn't catch it quick enough <laughs> oh it's painful but i'll go ahead and put it out there because yes. it's it's something that's actually non-verbal and yet extremely powerful and it grieved me to no end fortunately it's largely extinguished itself now in the family but you know i've shared here on the podcast before about the years that i was so racked with pain from Lyme disease that my central nervous system just reacted to all kinds of stimuli. I couldn't be around the family very much, couldn't handle loud noises, bright lights, uh, chaos, you know, uh, strong smells and, and everything, just, just too overwhelming. So my face showed that a lot. In fact, I'm sure my whole countenance showed it. Like I was just, you know, wound up as tight as a rubber band frequently because I was trying to control what I would say, because if I would correct a child, it came out really harsh or terse or just too, too angry because it was a reflection of the pain I was already feeling physically. I was trying not to verbalize my corrections as frequently as I wanted to be giving them, but my face still showed my displeasure. And again, because the face was racked with pain, those faces must have been scary faces because they still got the behavior to stop, you know, <laughs> like your hey there, Mike, it doesn't take much. But I began to see that my older kids started to model with the younger kids when they would correct the younger kids, appropriately so, but they were mimicking that same face. 
and, and at first it, it took me back like, hey, whoa, wait a minute. You know, you can give them correction, but it doesn't need to look like you hate them. And then I went, whoa, I know where they're picking up that look. And that, uh, yes, that, that one has taken a long time to, like I say, largely extinguish. Fortunately, a lot of it came because I got out of that incredible time of pain. Like I said at the beginning of today's podcast, it's those little nuances. They, they not only language it the way we do, they, they put it voice inflection and a little facial expression or like you said, the little limp there or whatever. They don't miss a trick. They get the whole thing. And uh, yeah, sometimes we need to really pay attention to that and, and apologize mm-hmm. to them. Say, hey, I've noticed that you guys are doing this. I know you got that from me. I wasn't even aware I was doing that. I don't want to do that. That's not a good thing to do with other people. It doesn't show love. And like, like own it, you know, just, just put it out there, own it, and let them know, look, I'm going to work on changing that. You guys do the same. Don't pick that up. We don't want our family to be characterized by those kind of qualities. I love that you not only gave the example, but then also moved to that idea of asking for forgiveness and apologizing yeah. uh, to them. In fact, I'll, I'll raise my hand and lift, lift my finger from my nose to go next because this one's fresh. Oh. This is probably just a few weeks ago, right? Where we were rushed getting out the door to get to a responsibility at church in the morning. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty much the guy that's the one say hey, I'm on time and regimented and trying to get the family in the car and everyone on the same schedule is hard sometimes, right? Especially you had two girls hair to do in the morning and dress, you know, all that stuff. Right. Anyway, fast forward, we had a, a, we were late, had a tough drive up there and exchanged some words. We're not kind to one another, Alicia and I, uh, and I just, you know, kind of lost my cool on, on that in terms of just like, come on, like, can't we get it together after 20 years? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and man, I felt so, bad about that because here they are listening in the back as we're going to church nonetheless. Right. And, uh, and, but what happened was, you know, we rushed them off into their kids stuff, but I felt the conviction that before we even were to set foot in that sanctuary that I need to sit down with her and, and just apologize a little myself, say I was wrong, which was good. But then also getting the kids back into the car after church afterwards before we left the parking lot, I just, you know, looked back and went, guys, I need to ask for your forgiveness. I need to apologize. I treated your mom poorly. And um, man, that was tough to do, but it was a teachable moment like we're talking about where they learned something a couple hours earlier. And, and hopefully they caught when you do something wrong, you need to ask for forgiveness. Mm-hmm. That's good. Chris and Chris, thank you for having the stones to share real life examples of what we've all experienced in different ways. Every single one of us loses our cool, acts in a way where we're not proud of. And the most powerful part of both of those stories is how you guys came back to your families and apologized, owned it and said, not only was I wrong, but this isn't the way I want to act and I'm working on it and I want to get better. Like just showing them that part is incredible and something we can all learn from. One of my favorite parts of the day is when I put the kids to bed. Sometimes when Gunnar and I are laying in bed together, I always say, let's talk. I just want to create some space where we can have some open dialogue. And one of the things I ask is what questions do you have for me? Whenever I get in the bed, he asks me the same thing. What questions do you have for me? I get an opportunity to ask him something very personal about himself or what his perception on how something specific is going in the house or at school or with his friends, and it opens up this dialogue. That's been a cool thing is finding which where each one of my kids feels comfortable in talking and sharing. And for me and Gunnar, it's laying in his bed at the end of the night. Mm -hmm. That time is so valuable. And him knowing that I want to know about him and want to dig a little deeper with him and ask him questions, he's starting to return that same thing and, and draw things out of me as a dad and give me an opportunity to speak into his life. Yeah, I took the easy way out by sharing something good there. So thanks, uh, <laughs> Nehemiah McCluskey. For- <laughs> your, your halo's got a good polish on it right yeah, now. <laughs> we're taking one for the team so I can elevate my insecure <laughs> self. Thank you. <laughs> 
I'll combine the negative and the positive there, though. That humility that the Chris has shared, it just spills over into those relational moments like what you talked about with Gunnar, Michael. If you have those moments of being vulnerable and leading by owning your stuff and saying, I was wrong and I apologize, it doesn't happen when the same way when your dad comes to your bed and you know this guy is kind of a hypocrite. I mean, four-year-olds and five-year-olds understand that stuff. So I think that's really a powerful example. It just, it leads to more connectedness with our kids that we love when we're humble and then we can come to them at night and just have a deep connection. And we really create a rift in our relationship when, we, when we're fake and we don't own our own stuff. I think both of those are important. Yeah, well said, Jamie. So what about you? You know, we're talking about teaching our kids and sometimes we think about as dads wanting to teach them certain things or certain virtues or morals or whatever but let's be frank they are learning a lot as little sponges in our house how they're observing our communication our emotions our attitudes our actions so we just challenge you to take time and maybe this is a conversation with your spouse to sit down and really discuss what are we communicating in this house? As a father, as a mom, as a team, as a unit, what are we communicating? What are we teaching to our children? Maybe there's some course corrections you need to make, like we've shared here. In fact, I know there are. And that's okay. It's okay to have that because we have to grow in this. We've got to mature. This is a daily opportunity to teach our kids, to instruct them well. And it starts with you. So sit down and take some time. Communicate as a team. Understand the, the ways each of your children love and receive love. And you'll be even more equipped to teach them well. So what about you? 